Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. So welcome to creating the immersive mobile game experience. My name is Adam Levinson. I'm COO of Somatone Interactive. We're the leading music and sound production company specializing in mobile games. So, mobile devices. They're small. They're like the size of a credit card. Nothing like your PS4 or your Xbox hooked up to your big screen TV in your living room. And yet, we're all addicted. We're all like hunched over, looking at our phones all the time, looking at our tablets, looking at our phablets. We're immersed in our favorite mobile games. Just take BART or Caltrain's and check it out, right? People are just completely into it. And it's controversial. In fact, a uh, public interest, interest lawyer is famously suing Apple and Google right now for creating addictive devices that cause car accidents. So even in the legal field. But mobile games are going to get even more immersive. That's what we're here to talk about. It seems inevitable. Every passing year, tens of thousands of new mobile games are distributed. Nick was just talking about that. In fact, as Nick pointed out in his panel just a few minutes ago, 15,000 new apps came out in July alone. That is unbelievable. And because of this vast marketplace, capturing and retaining players it now requires attention-getting presentation. You gotta do more. You gotta find a new way of getting attention. And that means technolo technological developments geared towards retaining players. So that's what we're here to talk about. The immersive mobile game experience and what's involved. So this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna introduce the panel. Oh, they're gonna introduce themselves. I'm gonna provide a scintillating overview then we're going to engage each panelist in immersive conversation. And then we're going to throw out some general questions for everybody. And then we're going to involve the vast audience, including our friends. So to get things started, we have an awesome panel of experts here. And I'm really proud and happy to have each of you. Thank you for being here. Um, and I think the best thing to do is to have you introduce yourselves. Why don't we start with Mr. Nick Thomas, even though you introduced yourself just a few minutes ago. Hello everyone, my name is Nick. I'm the head of gaming at Immersion. Uh, Immersion is a publicly traded tech company. Uh, we're based here in Silicon Valley uh, with offices in uh, Montreal and China. Uh, and we are the creators of haptic technology. So um, most famously we're known for uh, Rumble in PlayStation and Xbox, uh, but we're in wearables, we're in medical devices, automotive touchscreens, and now course, mobile gaming. So um, that's my background, and that's what I'll be sharing. Stereo. Of course. It's in stereo. In surround. Of course. <laughs> my name's Andy. I'm developer relations manager for Dolby Labs, a little company in San Francisco you may have heard of. Um, tiny. Yeah. About, about 50 years worth of sound work out there. Um, a lot of people look at us at some of these digital conferences and say, what in the world are you guys doing here? Um, We've started to kind of extend our reach into mobile devices. We're already in consoles, um, and so we're trying to bring more of that immersion factor. I'm going to say immersion an awful lot. Just we need to say immersion, immersification, and immerse. And immersify. Yes. We can verbize it. Anyway, um, we're trying to add a little bit of the immersion on the audio front as well on some of these mobile applications. Lots of devices have us built in. More every day. My turn, and I won't bore you by singing karaoke or anything like that. I'm Paul Brownlow. Uh, well, and this is where the interesting part gets uh, we get to talk about. I, if we had said this a week ago, I'd say from Game House, and I, I had a product there. But uh, our business, Game House, is two businesses. One is PC download. The other is social gaming. Uh, social gaming side it includes our Slingo branded games, uh, Slingo Adventure, Slingo Shuffle, uh, and and also Social Casino was acquired this week by Gaming Realms, a real money gaming uh, company out of out of the UK. We're super excited about it, uh, and um, the, a bit of history here too is I I, I 
through the uh, the mobile business for Double Down Interactive from zero to a lot in short order. Uh, I'm sure I, I don't have to throw out the numbers for you. And so uh, doing the same thing over here with uh, with a new company, which we're uh, calling Blastworks. So Paul, when when was your first ex computer experience? Oh, now, now so <laughs> now, I thought now you're going to see how old I am really here. But my first computer experience is no lie was uh, in February of 1968. That is incredible. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. I, I would, don't. And I, but I was much younger and much smaller and shorter then. But. And it was actually an abacus. Uh, it, just once. It was, it, it was actually it was pretty fun. Is that rhythmic? Yeah, it was. It was really just just a little bit more than that. But yeah. Ben. My name is Ben Sutherland. Uh, I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Present Creative, which is a game development studio here in San Francisco. We've been around for 12 years, uh, and uh, our focus has always sort of been on the creation of high-quality content for these games. Um, mobile is definitely one of the major focuses we do, and I think I was called onto the onto this panel to be sort of the resident nerd and futurist. Yes. In fact, Ben mentioned to me that he was excited to do this so that we could have a nerdy future tech talk. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so let's get into the fun stuff. I'm going to do a quick overview, like I said, and then we'll get back to our cool panelists. So sight, sound, smell, touch. As Nick mentioned in his last panel, we are not going to discuss taste, because that is just not OK. <laughs> it is not OK to lick your phone or do anything related to that, at least for now, for the next two years maybe, then we'll, I'm sure we'll be licking our phones. So let's talk about something else fun, smell. Now you may think, I'm joking, but there is actually some really cool new technology around smell. So for example, scent that alerts you when you get a text message with the new Scenty smartphone attach attachment. I'm not kidding, I'm, you guys are laughing, don't laugh. <laughs> Excellent. You are a game designer. <laughs> then there's the O phone, a scent phone that sends and receives different smells. All right, here we go. Let's check this out. This video is awesome. What is the smell of a grilled cheese sandwich? It's hard to describe, isn't it? Sometimes all we need is a reminder from the other senses. I can say to you that this coffee has notes of chocolate, almond butter, and strawberry jam. Oh my god, what just happened? No. And you get a pretty good idea of what I mean. But no way of evoking a scent can produce the emotion of perceiving the scent itself. Biologically, we respond to an aroma in a powerful way that is very unlike how we respond to words, images, and sounds. The word croissant may grab my attention, but smelling one makes me hungry. Introducing Ophone. Ophone is like a phone for aroma. It works with a mobile messaging app that lets you take a picture, tag it with over 300,000 possibilities, and send it as an O-note to friends. When you receive an O-note, you play it on the Ophone like this. Wow. No. The question is, how does all this work? Let me tell you a story of two okay, friends. Lucien lives here in Paris. Laura lives in LA. Was that before or after Weekend Update? I, I don't know, but <laughs> nobody could have done that as well as that guy. That guy is perfect for Ophone. I'm not sure why it was translated into French, but it all sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Okay. My favorite subject is next. Sound. Very close and dear to my heart, and I know it's true for other people in the panel. Uh, Maybe this is the most sort of accessible form of sensory immersion. Like Nick was saying again, we all appreciate good music and we're all moved by it. Sound seems to go directly into our souls and affect our moods, affect the way we enjoy things. And many people claim that, you know, audio is 50% of the game experience, a very controversial idea in itself since I'm not sure how game design fits in when 50% of the experience is audio. But with sound, you know, immersion can be evoked with compelling content only. You don't really need technology. But fortunately, we can make it even more immersive since we have Dolby Audio, for example, which enhances game audio with virtual surround. It makes games sound way bigger. It's kind of like having a portable home theater in your hands. Then there's 3D positional audio. We'll talk a little bit about that too. Uses psychoacoustics 
to make sound happen all around you. Now, there's a game called Papa Sangre. I'm going to show you another video. This one is not quite as funny as the O-Phone video, but Papa Sangre is a thriller horror game based only on 3D audio. Oh, here we go. Thank you for that. Hello. You were in the garden where people go when they die. But I can get you back. Now do as I say. Or very soon, you'll forget everything and everyone you've ever known. I'll warn you, it's going to be difficult. And it's not going to be nice. Pretty provocative stuff. Papa okay, how do it's we get to the next game? line? It's a mobile game. Next, everyone's favorite subject. Visuals, art, Ben's world. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay. Take it. Visuals have kind of always led the pack, right? In advancements for games. It, they've always been on the cutting edge. And new advancements in holography and 3D visualization most famously with the Amazon Fire Phone. Who here has an Amazon Fire Phone? Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Is it in your pocket now? No, I have my. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> so, related to this, new forms of augmented reality that was discussed in the panel before me. And GPS-integrated uh, mobile games like Ingress. So Ingress is a, uh, check this out, augmented reality, massively multiplayer, online role-playing, location-based game <laughs> created by Niantic. Check this out. Can I actually make this video work? That's my question. Here we go. What was the net effect of the Niantic project? We had crossed a threshold in which global security could be at risk. Decrypting the data was the mistake. This is not psychosis or some cognitive break, but an actual takeover of the mind. Much of the public sculpture found in our cities is based on design seeded in the human mind. Certain places have an energy that not only attracts people, but attracts events. The mission of 13 Magnus is to monitor the effects of mind hacking. Obviously, this will be done with the highest of security, to make sure that the ideas do not contaminate or threaten humanity. This all leads to Niantic. I know that many tools will be needed to fight this battle. You just have to know where to look and know what you're seeing. Portals emit exotic matter into our world, and that matter has certain effects on our world. I started noticing that there were energy fields anomalies on Earth all around me. A few of them exhibit properties that are as yet unexplained. I know that there are others out there. What if they're already among us, but we don't realize it? And I must be prepared to okay. work with them. <laughs> what, that, <laughs> what that game is going to create is more people bumping into you on the street, right? Where you're like, hold it, you know, you had the experience today, right? Heads up, man. Heads up, man. <laughs> right at me. My next favorite subject, haptics. Games you can feel. We like feeling. We like understanding through touch. It's natural. So haptics, I think you all know, and certainly the panelists know, is the technology of touch sense. It's a logical, inevitable progression for mobile devices. And that's why we're seeing an emergence of very unique technologies. Fujitsu has created an ultrasonic vibration tablet. Very interesting. Disney is creating electromagnetic haptic te technology. Immersion is making it possible for mobile game creators to integrate haptics into gameplay. And new wearables incorporate haptics technologies that you can feel 
check this little video out. Your life is a series of interconnected moments, people, occasions, and experiences. Wouldn't it be great if you had a wearable personal assistant to let you know right away when something important happened? Introducing Taya by ViaWare, a smart bracelet and fitness tracker that syncs with your phone to help you prioritize the most important things in your life easily, reliably, discreetly, and beautifully. Because quality time is a luxury. Enjoy every moment. All of these things make people happier. Everybody in these videos looks happy, <laughs> except the dead guy. <laughs> Let's now talk to our excellent panelists. I'd like to start with Andy. Is that okay? Speaking of the dead guy, go ahead. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Andy, how does Dolby Audio enhance gameplay? Can you tell us a little bit about how it works and, sure. and what it does? Yeah. Um, I think we're all familiar with people saying the audio sucks on my phone, right? And you know, this guy's mono. There's one speaker that comes out of that. Anybody have a stereo phone, one of the new HTC models? Anyone? Do you even know? That's the problem. We've been trained into this, audio sucks, mute it, and move on with your day, right? Some of us carry headphones to get some of the audio, but we kind of accept that compromise right now. In the past two years, we've had a lot of success putting Dolby Digital Plus technology into some of the tablets out there. And, and you notice things like people give reviews that, wow, I'm really into this game, and for some reason the soundtrack gets in my head. Um, and that you know, some of the, the audio cues help me find some of the solutions here and things like that. We kind of think that these are the little breadcrumbs that lead people to realize that, oh my gosh, audio is a bigger part of the picture. Because we see in things like the Xbox and the PS4, you cut out you know, good surround sound, you cut, out, you cut out really high quality audio, and people disengage very quickly. You give reality a chance to insert itself on top of the experience, and you lose people. So, reverse the picture, you give people good audio, you give people good video and good games, and a, you know, a good experience, they stay in for a lot longer. They see more ads, they play a lot longer, they give you better reviews, and they buy more apps from you. So, so in a sense, that's the problem that Dolby Audio solves. It's the problem that we solve, and it's the problem that we still have, too, because we haven't conquered the entire world yet, obviously. We haven't been able to get this kind of audio into everything out there, but we are seeing a real delta between the devices that don't reproduce audio well and the games, that don't, games apps that don't produce audio very well and the apps and games or devices on the other side that do a very good job of it. Can you tell us a little bit about 3D audio and, and what that is and how it works and sure. how it might affect gameplay? Yeah. Um, anybody heard of Dolby Atmos? One, two, three, four. Better than the Amazon phone, we're doing good. Uh, um, so Atmos, for those of you who don't know it, it's surround sound with height, right? So there's upward firing or downward firing speakers, depending on how much money you got and how much license you have to bolt speakers to your ceiling. Um, it's used a lot in movies right now to really provide that, that surround experience where a helicopter can fly around your head, above and below, and it's kind of cool. We're seeing some gaming developers, especially the high-end AAA gaming developers, who are really interested in this because it gives you cues about the guy walking around overhead who's about to, who's about to shoot you, which gives a player a competitive edge. Um, we see people who do adventure games really wanting to set that dramatic um, soundscape. Like, um, I'm trying to think of one. Uh, I, I'm thinking Ingress would be the perfect one, but that creepy on-edge kind of music to really surround you and envelop you in this environment in the game. Again, cutting out um, reality. You know, 2D works pretty well. When you get that 3D experience, it really enhances the whole thing, and it really kind of pulls you into the world, as long as the game is also believable. So I want to throw this next question out to the whole panel about sound. And I know there's some other sound experts on the panel. So what kind of games are sort of the best candidates for immersion through sound? What's, what genres of games does, in which you know, sound really makes a difference? I would definitely say one where you have control over either the living room setup of speakers or mm -hmm. you know people are going to be wearing headphones because exactly as you pointed out, there will be a barrier just based on the hardware. Okay. So if you're targeting just a purely mobile audience, then while those few players who have the nice headset are going to get the experience, the majority of them aren't, and then people will make the decision as to whether or not they should spend the budget on that en enhanced and better, more immersive sound experience. Do you think a headset is the difference maker? That's, do, you, do you see that as being a necessity, sort of, in terms of fully immersing in, in the audio of a game? Uh, I would love to be proved otherwise by great individual hardware that, that does that um, on just the phone level, but I personally haven't seen that yet. Not I don't know if you guys actually have examples, and I just haven't seen those. But um, so as of right now, yes. Here's an interesting point. NPD Research Group, who's a sponsor of this conference, says 
that most people, and this is a real shocker, enjoy game mobile audio through the speakers. Amazing. How does audio help to immerse players? What about audio brings people more into the game? Nick. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I love this topic. So audio is near and dear to my heart. Um, I, my personal favorite are sort of adventure storyline based games where music really plays a sort of emotional role in the story. And so, you know, music and sound effects are great in casual games, but when you kind of take the next step and you have more of a storyline, you want to communicate, you know, kind of how you're supposed to feel uh, as you're through, you know, moving through the journey of the game itself. That is, to me, where audio really shines because it adds the, the emotional quality uh, to kind of communicate how you're supposed to feel. And that's, you know, for me, that's, that's sort of the, the holy grail of the audio experience is the emotional value of what audio is communicating, not just like bling blang, uh, you know, sound effects and so forth, which are still great and fun in a kind of a casual sense. But you know, getting into the story and really immersing into a world is done through narrative. And music does a great job to tell narrative stories. If I can just add, I think, I mean, you've hit on a key thing here. It's about the emotion. And, 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 and that's the enhancement that audio does. But, and, and, and from my background, I mean, you know, with, with casino gaming, right? It's, the, the emotion is really important and the audio is extremely important in celebrating big wins, making people, you know, it, it's, it's firing, firing the, you know, getting those dopamine receptors going, and, and that's that's what the audio does. And so, if I, you know, have a five million coin win, I want to feel really, really good. I want to feel really rich. And and the more I, you know, the more, the more of my senses that I can stimulate to make that, to to get that point home, that's what's going to be effective, and it's going to make a great experience. I thought it was endorphins. Dopamine. Oh, dopamine. Okay. Dopamine. Okay. okay. <laughs> if I may, um, so we've been on a number of projects. Um, more often, actually probably all of the audio related projects, we have the task of cutting through to get to the user, particularly on slot machines. There's, there's the task of if it's a real money slot and a brick and mortar slot, then you're trying to cut through this sea of other noise um, on, the, on an individual mobile or an individual downloadable game where you don't predict a nice sound system. You're, you're trying to cut through that an event has happened and deliver an, an additional um, uh, poof of endorphins, if you will. Um, <laughs> uh, whereas there are games uh, that's like... The next, that's the next panel. OK, we'll talk. <laughs> whereas there are games, uh, was it Osmosis was a fantastic example, a mobile game where you actually, uh, you, that was one of the only games where I consistently stopped put on a head, uh, pair of headphones to play that game and be able to have the full experience because you could really feel as you sped up and slowed down time through the audio cues. Um, as you get further and further into games like that, though, you're getting uh, less and less likely to be a casual mobile in that right. I can pick it up very quickly and I can put it down very quickly. Yeah. Um, and you get more into the realm of dedicated uh, time to those products. And a, and a great game with great immersive qualities can turn you into that, um, the type of player who is actually dedicating time instead of just using spare time. Um, so kind of what you're suggesting is that immersive audio points to more like a core game, like a mid-core game. So I, I would disagree with that. Uh, with relatively recent games, there's a game that uh, is called King's Road, and it was a PC uh, online game, and they moved it to mobile. And the game loop is cool because it's essentially a dungeon crawler style uh, RPG. But the dungeon aspect is short. I mean, you're intended to get from the beginning of your quest to the end in you know, a minute or two. Uh, and then you come back to your base, and you collect your loot, and you kind of sell and buy and evolve your gems and whatnot. Um, and the, the mechanic is very casual. It's quick in and out. You can pick it up, play it for a minute or two. But the audio is still highly narrative and highly immersive, so you can get in quick and you can be on that journey and be in danger and then conquer and succeed and feel great and pop right out. And you don't have to do that for hours at a time. You can do it you know, in a matter of minutes. You guys should all download King's Road and check it out because it's a great example of real kind of narrative immersion in kind of bite-sized pieces. And in that game, um, when you do play it, are you putting on a pair of headphones? Or are, are you the no. type of gamer who actually drops on headphones? I, when I, no, no, because I'm not usually carrying headphones with me. Right. And so I'm on the bus or wherever. 
Um, but I do turn on the audio and I turn it up, and I do it because I really like how the game performs emotionally with that layer. I think it's a great transition point to start talking about haptics. Nick, can you talk to us a little bit about the relationship between haptics and sound? Sure. Yeah, and so there's sort of two parts to this. One is, you know, so I, I would never dispute the value of audio. However, in the mobile environment, audio is not always appropriate because you're, you know, going to disturb your neighbors or you're at work and you don't want people to know you're playing a game or you're on the bus <laughs> and it's so loud you can't really hear it anyhow, which is like effectively muted. And so if you look at audio being 50% of the experience, you've lost 50% of your game. And that's a big loss when you're trying to create immersive experiences. So you are now in the mobile world presented with the reality where a significant you know, portion of the time, you're limited to a pure visual experience and disconnecting in all these other ways that are normally available to players. And this is something that Haptics is really particularly great at solving. And if there was a problem worth solving, apart from adding this new layer, um, the problem we're solving is keeping players immersed when audio isn't possible or convenient in the environment that you happen to be in. Because haptics is not rumble. It's not on-off vibration like you've received a text message. It's detailed, subtle, crafted, uh, tactile effects that can really communicate emotional or kind of functional uh, aspects in the game. So you can make a big win feel even bigger when your phone comes alive in your hand and it delights you because you get this rewarding physical kind of response. Or you can make a small spell with your level one character feel <laughs> insignificant compared to a level 20 character big spell. You can really feel that that was a more powerful action uh, where audio might also communicate that it's not always available to you. And when it's not, haptics are a great way to still always be engaging. And you don't ever need to turn it off because it's, you don't hear it. It's just kind of you know, private in a way, which is very nice in the mobile space. If I may, if we're talking about both mobile and immersive and mobile immersive casual, the stuff that you guys are doing is some of the only stuff that actually can qualify for that entire branch. It's the same gear that you have. So it's, it, it is an entirely pick up, put down. I didn't have to put on headphones. I didn't have to s disappear into iPhones. Um, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> uh, so that, if we're, if we're talking strictly about the mobile experience of immersion, that's one of the only uh, sets of, of tools that I actually feel like is actually there for most people. Yeah, and we've done research and collected data on this topic, and just uh, it's it kind of irrefutable that the the addition of haptics keeps people engaged, it keeps people immersed, it adds to the retention of players because they just like it. It just is more fun and exciting when you're engaging. I mean, it's all about the senses, right? I mean, we talked about taste and smell, and like, you know, if it was done in a presumably appropriate way, maybe those things actually do enhance your engagement, and you know. For sure, the sense of touch adds to engagement. It, it helps us engage with what we're doing, and we see proof points of that all over the place, and that's why we're seeing such a surge in adoption right now. So do we think that these technologies work best in concert, or are you kind of suggesting that haptics is kind of like a replacement for sound? No, and that's a great point. It's really best when they're all working together. I mean, the best experience of a game with haptic technology is with the audio on, because the haptic events are designed to really complement the visual and audio cues. So you get this full, it's like the whole enchilada. You get it all. Um, and that's when things really, really pop. Should we feel the O phone, the smell phone? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know <laughs> about that. <laughs> that's just too much, right? I got to smell it first. <laughs> OK, right. The smell test. So what's? What's on the technical horizon for haptics? What do you see as the future? Well, you know, I mean, that's a, it's a pretty amazing field because there's so much that can be done with technology. I mean, you were talking about kind of electrostatic functionality, being able to change the texture of physical surfaces. Um, there's VR and a whole sort of wide open kind of world in terms of how input in the virtual reality experience kind of, you know, 
makes the the game more exciting and helps communicate what's a, what's going on. Um, it's kind of wide open. It's sort of like saying what's next for right. video. You know, like it can it just can expand and keep going and going with technology and innovation. Okay, let me ask this question for the whole panel then. Are haptics technologies inevitable? Are we certainly, definitely going to see touch on you know our our phones and our pad, iPads and our various mobile technologies in the future? Is absolutely. it absolutely? Yes, absolutely. Anything else? Other comments, Andy? Absolutely. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you for that confirmation. I actually think it's going to be exciting to see how it, it evolves. I mean, especially as we move to more wearable technology. And I think, uh, you know, there's a, a point that Ben made here earlier about that. In, when we think about the title of this is about mobile, you know, immersive a mobile immersive, immersive uh, whatever. <laughs> Dopamine somewhere. <laughs> Let me throw that in there. Uh, but, but, and the key is it's it's the things that you have and that you're wearing and that you're carrying with you. And it's not adding, you know, it's it's not something additional. You're not making appointments. You're not, you know, kind of setting yourself up around. And there is, I mean, even for for some people, the the, the high definition audio is definitely, um, you know, definitely part of that. Beats headphones aside, but you know we'll that's a different. I think it's a different topic. But uh, so as as you know, have more devices. I mean, think about you know watches or or other types of things that we'll end up wearing. That they, if they have ways to be able to sim stimulate other senses, then that just becomes part of that whole ecosystem that will enhance the game play. Dopamine just triggering like all left over right. overload. Endorphins, <laughs> adrenaline, other enzymes. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Um, Nick, did you want to talk about sort of the, gro the growing popularity of, ha of, of haptics? You already touched on it a little bit, but... Yeah, you know, haptics are... Um, haptic, we, we sort of look at 2016 as the year of 3D printing, virtual reality, and haptics. These are technologies that we've sort of been hearing about, and it's like sort of sci-fi futuristic stuff that now is here. You know, I mean, 3D printing, like you can go buy a 3D printer at like Best Buy and go home and 3D print whatever you want. And you can go and essentially have a full VR experience now. I mean, you can buy a Gear VR Oculus headset and put your Samsung Note 4 in it. And there's a whole app store you can go have VR today. Haptics are here and it's like, you know, it's like the future has arrived. And so now what we're seeing is this sort of awakening, like, this is, uh, and it's an amazing moment actually to be a part of this technology because it's, it's that kind of transition point where people realize it's real, they realize the value, and now there's this massive sort of how do I do this? Like it's this educational sort of uh, quest that we're on to just educate and inform like this is how you create haptic experiences because it has really never been done. And so we're now having to kind of communicate and share with the whole world, this is how you do it, and this is how you do it right. And that, I mean, that's a lot of work to do, but it's very exciting work. I have a question, if I may. So uh, in the three examples you just listed, uh, 3D printing, uh, VR experiences, and Haptech, uh, 3D printing is available right now, but it's relatively low resolution, at least at the consumer model. Um, VR is available right now. There's amazing experiences, but there might be an amount of uh, seasickness that comes along with it. And you can, from those two, we can talk about there's better resolution coming here and there's better latency coming here. What's uh, just on the corner for Haptech that's the, here's the next step we have to solve? Yeah, you know, it's sort of the content hardware, con you know, uh, paradigm where the hardware is at a certain point um, of performance. And as the content side gets better and more detailed, the hardware then moves its you know, side of the ledger forward to create more high fidelity uh, capabilities. So it's, it's kind of like audio and speakers, right? I mean, once upon a time, we had very basic speakers and then you know, Dolby showed up and made you know, things sound better. And so then research was done on how to make speakers be designed in such a way to be able to realize that new improved audio experience. And they both kind of moved forward incrementally to get to where we are today, uh, where you can have these unbelievably high fidelity sonic experiences. I'd say we're sort of at the beginning, you know, early stages of that same process. 
Great. So it's going to get better and better with more technology, more content, better phones, better actuators, more research and development to just make it, you know, feel more and more exciting. Thanks. That's great. Visuals have always seemed to lead the pack, as we talked about earlier, always on the cutting edge of technology. And now it's Ben's chance to get seriously nerdy and talk to us about future possibilities. So Ben, like, what is the state of the art? What is the current state of the art for animation and art technologies, for mobile specifically? Uh, specifically as related to immersive experience? Yes, exactly. Um, well, there's, to start with, there's every demo that we've seen this, this conference of the different Oculus games. Um, so, so everyone sort of knows about this realm of what it's like to uh, leave the casual space, strap on uh, some, a face apparatus, and completely get dropped into uh, a VR immersive experience. Um, I guess one of the things I would argue, uh, if we're talking strictly on the hardware level, is the departure uh, that, that I need to do as a person from a shared uh, social experience to this very uh, solitary or at least totally independent experience will most likely keep reducing down and down. So that's not necessarily talking about the visuals and the content being presented to you, but rather one of the major barriers for this more common, uh, the perhaps most common uh, or most talked about at this conference, immersive experience. Um, so do you think then immersion means antisocial behavior? <laughs> uh, I think there is a, uh, yes, it is hard to be both casual and immersed. Um, so very much so actually, yeah. Uh, th I think a lot of the immersive tech that we're talking about, again, if it's not bundled with uh, an existing piece of mobile gear you might have, is actually more targeted towards the console market uh, or at least it will be that uh, it will replace the, 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 the time and space that I would have done it, would have been my console time. I might have a small portable version, but it's really not my, I don't think it's my, uh, my, my two minutes in the bathroom that I'm gonna have immersive experiences. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's more like, yeah, I, <laughs> it's, it's more, more I, I need that. to find a, <laughs> I don't know if any, uh, if any of the parties over the past couple of days, anyone actually <laughs> did one of the demos where you put on an actual VR thing and you're still at a party. There's still people drinking all around you and sort of bumping into you as you're, as you're trying to have this immersive experience. Um, but it's another example of just how not casual it is. Right. So do you think maybe holography and other 3D visualization technologies is, is, is going to be or more of the future of casual mobile? Well, I, I definitely think that both holography, which is great, everyone's actually sharing the same mm. screen, uh, right. if that text exists where you can actually see it from different angles, um, as well as an alternate social environment where everyone has, uh, to use the matrix terminology, jacked into the same environment, right? Um, that is still absolutely a social uh, experience, but it's just not a casual experience. So I've had to, I, if casual means, um, that I can still do it within sort of the, com the confines of the social contract and in everyday living space, then the immersive experience is the opposite of that. There will be social experiences that are absolutely immersive, but you've at least started by sitting down and not being somewhere out and about. It's interesting that you say social contract. I've heard that phrase come up at this conference a couple of times in relation to VR and AR and how isolating it can be. Well, the, um, the, at GDC this year, there was the large, I think it was the Samsung VR lounge. And that was, it was definitely a glimpse into the future of just how boring looking people playing VR games is. Um, there's a whole lounge of people just absolutely detached from reality, just, uh, from what I can tell, blank staring into an immersive experience. So this is for the whole panel related to that. Do people want this stuff? I mean, do people like VR and, and, and holographic, you know, uh, uh, mobile device technology? Do people really want the Amazon Fire Phone with 3D whatever that was? Uh, well, well uh, Amazon specifically, they voted no. Exactly, <laughs> right. Uh, I would say absolutely. People absolutely want to depart from their normal life and drop into um, a to have a heightened sense, a heightened suspension of disbelief. Um, and that absolutely is sold better through immersive experiences. So yeah, I think, I think the continued 
collection of all these immersive tools is going to um, allow people to continue to um, depart from reality. Depart from reality. I, I sort of look at it like a like a roller coaster or a theme park. Like I, I don't want to be on a roller coaster all the time. Like right. you, Disneyland, you go into and you you, you got to get out of there after a little while. It's great, but like you can't do it all the time because it's just too overwhelming. Right. So I I could see popping on a headset doing something for five, ten minutes, and then that would be the end for me, I think, and I would want to get back to reality. Uh, I absolutely agree. Like, um, uh, Upon putting on a headset right now, when I take it off after that amount of time, I feel as though I got off a roller coaster of some sort. You're a bit I'm, relieved, right? I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm bringing myself back to my normal senses. Uh, it's it's uh, almost a, like a, a digital hangover of some sort that you're getting over from it. I think the content has a, a, a role to play with this too. Like right now, we have these experiences where they scare the crap out of you, or they make you seasick, right? And you know, if you talk to the guys at Jaunt, they want to put you in an experience you just don't have access to, like on stage with Paul McCartney. So I look this way, and Paul McCartney's singing and singing to me. And I look this way, and the drummer's looking at me weird. It's kind of cool. And their idea, that they float a few ideas, like Grandma can go to graduation from Wisconsin when kids are graduating out here, or you can go to every national park on, you know, in the book. And I think those are less jarring, every bit as immersive, but not quite as Roller coastery. I still think you'd have to take it off and go. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm not in Arizona anymore. It's okay. But, you know, I, I think there there's more of a duration there. I think there's less of a shock factor that goes on there. And I think everybody can find an experience like that that they can't hop on a plane and fly in Nepal, but they would put on a headset or a, a Gear VR and watch that for a couple hours. Well, you were joking about karaoke earlier, but a karaoke immersive VR experience where the singer puts on and gets to see themselves as they want, and the audience puts on and gets to uh, see the outfit that the singer selected. Um, and you have I no mean, idea it's like me, too. <laughs> and perhaps also has the golden throat technique, so it actually sounds better. You know, all that immersive experience would be fantastic. OK, great. Um, let's move on. Paul. He's the stereo guy. <laughs> so you've been, obviously, in this industry for a long time. First computer experience, 1968. <laughs> I didn't know. I should have never told him. So if immersive features mean more addictive gameplay, can we monetize these features? Uh, we can monetize anything, really. I, I, How do you think that would look? It's, uh, so so uh, I want to just frame a little bit more about the, you know, the immersive uh, experiences, and then it'll lead exactly into the, the monetization part. So we've been talking a lot about you know, immersion in, in, is enhancing senses and that were, you know, it's, it's, it's touch, it's the old phone smell, it's, you know, all, all these, uh, it, these senses. But when, when, I, when I think about uh, immersive um, experiences, I, I'll go back to one is, uh, you know, baseline requirement for, uh, is that it's something that you're, you're already carrying with you, especially when it's mobile. So, so then, and then you look at the, the capabilities of that device. So it may have, may have haptics, which is great, but they also have you know, be, ability to be able to, uh, you know, have location based, you know, location information. Um, there's, you know, uh, network information, uh, you know, social networks and other kinds of information. Uh, there, there's, um, you know, of course, there's the sound and the visuals as well. So, so th what that allows you to do, and what I think about it, is not just about the senses that are on your body, but it's also the environment that you're in. So, if you can be more immersed in that environment, that's how. Um, you know that's that's actually a more immersive and and kind of lightweight casual experience. I don't I'm not strapping on a headset. It's just that all of a sudden I'm reaching out into more things in my environment. I look at Ingress, and it's it's the one thing that's cool about it is that you may say it's AR, right? But it's but I kind of flip it the other way. It's like what what it does is it it has a, a you know your your play in the game is actually enhanced by what's what's in the physical world ar kind of goes the other way and says oh i'm in the physical world and i'm enhancing. and i'm enhancing that mm -hmm. this really goes the other way so mm -hmm. so you know taking those kinds of inputs um, i think it's important and we're looking at and experimenting with we always like to go try you know have hack days and try out new new technologies and see where we can take gaming even though we, you know we have we all have our core businesses but but the way you, the way you do, you know, get get big and scale and do great things is by taking risks and throwing fear out the window and trying crazy things. And and so, you know, the things we're looking at are ways to be able to to, to have the social network through voting mechanisms and other kinds of uh, interaction be able to enhance and direct uh, direct the play. And so, all of a sudden, everybody in this room 
it can it, it, it's not as, um, can can have an effect on the gameplay, maybe indirect or or you know based on some action they take. There may be an interaction between two players that causes a, another an unintended effect, and that can affect the, the play. And that I think it becomes more immersive. So so it sounds like you're talking about existing technologies using those like social networks and GPS, etc to create a more immersive experience, bringing those yeah. together into game design. Yes, exactly. And so, and, and then, I mean, when I think about monetizing, I, you know, so my path is, you know, get, pe get people, this is, it doesn't matter whether it's an immersive game or not, get people into the game, show them, delight them, have them, you know, keep them in the game and show them a really fun, you know, engaging experience. And then there's different ways to monetize through some, some is uh, you know by unlocking features or something like that because they're really they have a lot of dopamine going and addicted <laughs> on that Reference. or highly engaged we like to say in the casino industry. Um, but uh, you know, but but you know people will just you know kind of gravitate you. The I think the monetization opportunities become evident when you see what the behavior of people are. So if you know if people can end up having you know in, in a in a uh, you know true social game like I say where we're where we're taking inputs from from every person in the room, uh, whether it's it's passive or active, that that maybe the amount of activity that you have and the amount of influence can be monetized. And there's, I mean, w I'm sure we can all think of gr you know great ideas to do this, but I think where the opportunity is is again, take you know understand what these devices can really do and and how they tie you to your environment, and then bring those elements of the environment into the game. And make make a really cool experience, a really cool and engaging experience, instead of strapping something on so we're walking off the sidewalk and running into people, and <laughs> getting run over. <laughs> That's really interesting. Thanks. Um, so we only have like ten minutes left, but what I want to do now is I was going to throw some questions out to the panel. But what I'm thinking is I'm going to throw some questions out to the panel, but I would also <laughs> encourage you guys to uh, to participate. So if anybody has anything they want to add, please feel free. So we already kind of talked about this, but let's talk about it some more. What immersive features will define the next generation of mobile games? So what do we think is going to be like the leading technology coming up? Is it haptics? Is it sound? Is it smell? Taste? Well, I, I think just to jump in on what Paul was talking about, um, and you know, as relates to haptics, we're, we're we're at a point where it feels like we're taking a lot of existing games and existing products, and we're kind of bolting these experiences onto them and trying to figure out how to make it work and enhance the game. But what we haven't done is build games from scratch into these technologies. So you know, speaking from haptics, it's rare that we find somebody who ever builds a game with haptics as one of the primary considerations in the game design. They usually make the game and then they figure out how to add haptics into it afterwards. And right. that can be done, but if we really want to create immersive experiences, can we design a game that thinks about these things from the beginning? I sort of feel like we're still doing that with VR. Like we're taking these sort of known mechanics, we're bolting VR onto it, it doesn't really work very well. We gotta kind of think through the lens of VR when we're making this stuff if it's really gonna work well. And that's what we haven't done, and there's a big opportunity to do. So what, you're, what I think you're saying is that the f you know, what we'll be seeing is games designed with these features in mind from the very beginning. Yeah, I mean, Ingress yeah. actually is a perfect example of a game that has done that, in that it takes 3D positional like tracking, and it built a whole game around that core sort of functional mm -hmm. aspect. And so that's one game that has done it. But I think there's opportunities in mainstream gaming, you know, in Kabam or DNA or Rovio or whomever to think, well, I'm going to make a game and I'm going to use all these things right. and I'm going to design the game for these features. Any other comments about that from the audience? All right, I'm going to move on to the next one. Well, I, I was going to say audio. I would love to okay. see that be the next thing, but I don't think it is. I think it's that that intangible that people don't notice until they hear it. I think it's going to take combinations of apps and games that are made to use it, just like you said, or are, are built with audio in mind, or built with haptics in mind, and you know, better resolution, better depth. I think it's the, the suite of everything that comes together to make a better experience. It's not one thing. 
that was not worth pausing for. Sorry. No, it was <laughs> worth. That was gold. Are you kidding? I, I, it's kind of along the same lines, but uh, as we go forward, we need to get out of the novelty phase. Right now, we're talking about games that are like, oh, cool, check out this game. It has VR. Like that's the very first thing that you think about is like, hey, let's talk about a feature in it, as opposed to let's talk about a great game that just happens to be that. So yeah. as we branch out of the novelty phase of mm -hmm. any of these new technologies, we, we will start seeing hopefully the next generation or the first generation of actually uh, born into that style design. And we've seen, it's like history repeating itself. I think we went through this on the console side back in the day. Everything was a novelty back then. Oh my God, it's a console. Oh my God, it's a CD-ROM game. It was so cool, you just bought it no matter what. So I think it's cool to see history kind of repeating itself except with new features. And that's, a, that's, that's actually an interesting point because, I mean, we, we were actually having dinner the other night and I was saying, what's next for gaming? You know, every three, five years, this, game, this industry reinvents itself. It's PC downloadable, then it went to social gaming on Facebook, and now it's a mobile. And now we're like, what, what's next? Like, it's stuck here at mobile. And so maybe there is the next evolution coming, you know, chapter four or whatever, that is what Ben's talking about, where it's no longer novel, now it becomes like part of the integrated experience. And it's like this 2.0 of mobile. I say it's the O phone. It's all about, <laughs> I'm telling you. Um, what about this question? How will, the, it, no. How will the next generation of mobile games be distinct from AR and VR? And, and please, anybody in the audience who wants to make a comment, just go right in there and, and say it. Raise your hand first. Any comments on that? How, how, are, how is the next generation of mobile games going to be different from AR and VR? Will they be combined? What do we think? Again, I, I struggle on the word mobile. Um, it, it, thinking so much that mobile means casual, um, so, uh, but one of the areas that, besides Haptech, one of the areas where you can see where there's a slightly more immersive experience is actually second screen content, mm. right? So, um, for the most part, an anyone who has an iWatch or any of the other equivalent devices, the number one usage they do is just check messages with it, right? Um, but that alone can be a slightly more immersive experience in that I, I don't uh, put a game at, as far out of my mind. So I guess that is a very not AR or VR addition, but um, additional wearables as input devices or second screens for mobile games is, is one example. Okay, any other thoughts? All right, moving on. What do we think are the key challenges to the next stage in, in immersive technologies? Is it design? Is it, invest, is it people willing to invest time, invest money into integrating these SDKs, um, you know, relating it back to Nick's talk earlier tonight? Well, I, I, I think that Nick nailed it just a couple minutes ago where he said it, it, the key is really developing a, a compelling immersive experience from the ground up. It's, it is all bolt-ons right now. Right? And, that's, and, and it kind of feels that way. It's just, it's, you know, if we put, you know, surround sound on a on a big slot machine win yes it's more exciting but it just is still was a slot machine win and and so being able to you know to, the, the challenge is really to, for game designers to, and, and all of us to in this industry to really figure out like what is what now that we have all these great new toys what's the what's the kick-ass experience what's really going to delight everybody and that's and it's you know because we figure that out then we, we have all the tools to get it done I think there's actually a big challenge right now in the user input into this more immersive experience. So there's a great way for me to, f to get feedback as to what the 3D world around me looks like. There's the smell of phone. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's, there's haptech. So I'm, I'm receiving data, but how am I sending data? And there's only a few examples that are really impressive, and even those have their faults. Obviously, Connect is one. Um, the Leap, which is a really, really fun toy, but I don't have the finite control that I want to actually be able to uh, control an environment as I would think I would. Um, so I think the next big round of technology that can push forward what an immersive experience is comes from actually the user input. Um, what was it? It was the, uh, the, that new Google Project Soli thing. Is like you look at the, te uh, the demo video for that, and it's an amazingly impressive idea of a high fidelity user input into a uh, totally 3D uh, world. Therefore, like it could be in a virtual world. 
I think that's where a lot of tech money uh, and uh, product penetration has to come from to tackle the next hurdle of the immersive experience. Excellent. Any other comments? I would just add that it, to me, the, one of the key challenges is the, the, the risk tolerance that exists or lack thereof in the mobile gaming space with the publishers who really control the channels to adoption. And so, you know, if you're Kabam, you know, you're already focusing on just four games instead of 10 for the year. You're just so sort of myopic on your sort of known proven abilities to monetize that taking a chance is, is becoming harder and harder to do. So somewhere along the line, someone is going to have to step up and say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to, and I'm going to support it. And I'm going to try to push this as like the next thing because otherwise it's just going to be indies trying to incorporate all this and that's going to take forever to sort of really surface to the top. So we need someone willing to take a chance on some of these technologies. Thankfully we do have that sweet spot right now where because there still is the novelty phase, people hungry for a particular technology, there's actually a chance for indies to make money on the premium side. They've made a cool demo of, a, of, of technology. So while it's not at all um, going to cause mass adoption of it, it at least allows for, uh, for experimentation and uh, pushing the envelope forward somewhat, but only on the indie scale. Well, we only have a couple of minutes left. <clears throat> so let me leave you with this thought. I think we all agree that all of this is kind of inevitable. It's just sort of happening to us. It's organic. All of this is evolving. My question is, is it good? What's the benefit to people? I think these are interesting topics to think about. And with that, I'd like to know if there are any questions. Sir. Thank you, Sasha. Um, so basically, um, what, what you guys are saying that we are all waiting for this piece of content that's going to drive people to buy those VR sets? I, I actually think what uh, VR, uh, what a bunch of the technologies we're talking about really needs is the Ashton Kutcher, the guy who come in and just show how you can actually be cool while looking off into the distance and sort of being disconnected. <laughs> there needs to be some sort, of, some sort of champion of coolness who actually allows people to be that geeky uh, with these new toys. So because it's like a marketing problem? There's a marketing problem, yeah. B because it exists right now, right? I mean, people should, should have been able to buy those sets. Why doesn't it happen? Just barely. Right, um, the, the Samsung one is out. The Oculus one is only out uh, for devs right now, though that's supposed to change soon. So we are still, we are definitely still in early adopter phase. And also everyone knows that as soon as that Oculus one is actually out, there's going to be one slightly better than that. So it's only people who actually have that much spending cash um, to play with the new toy and know that that new toy is going to be out of date within a year that um, those are the only people who are actually adopting right now. I think there's even more friction there too because the Gear VR works only with Samsung devices and Oculus is going to be a proprietary thing too for a while. The, the content lives in those, in those silos and until we get to the point that the content works across everything that's out there, at least a good chunk of it, we're looking at the DVD versus Blu-ray thing, right? I mean, somebody's going to win the standard at some point and that's when the content's going to happen. I think great minds are chewing on this. I think they're coming up with great ideas, but they're kind of holding off to really fully deploy until they know it's going to get to millions of people instead of 10. 10,000, sorry, 10,000. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Great question. In the back. Uh, so I'm a big fan of haptic technology. The uh, Rumble Pack playing uh, GoldenEye. It was a formative moment <laughs> of my childhood. Um, my, pro I, the, my concern I have on mobile is that we don't necessarily have a consistent haptic language yet. So I worry that my users are going to be in a game, feel their phone vibrate, and want to check to see if someone's texting them. So how can we create a clear in-game haptic language that doesn't act as a interrupt and a signal for something else? So I think that that solution exists and it's just a understanding of how to use the technology uh, that's missing. So it's the educational part that I was talking about where when you feel 
haptics properly applied to your your game, th there's there's no misinterpreting what the f purpose is. Uh, when you incorporate haptics poorly, uh, and it's like some on-off binary experience that feels like a text message, you have problems. So sync is a great example. Like getting the sync of the audio and visual elements to match perfectly. So the envelope of the haptic effect is exactly right with what you're seeing and hearing, then there is a, a true, uh, it all coalesces. And in fact, we've done interesting studies where we've had people come in off the streets and given them haptic enhanced videos versus non-haptic enhanced videos and asked them afterwards uh, what they thought about it. And they almost didn't realize that they were experiencing the haptics we then would put a, a little bumper on it in front that said enhanced with haptic effects, give that to another group, and then they all of a sudden realized what was happening. The point being that the first group just felt like it was always meant to be there. And so they couldn't even distinguish haptics from the video and audio elements because it all worked so well together. So we need to work with people like yourselves who are a fan of the concept but don't understand how to kind of approach the technology so that we can demystify it and get it into, you know, broader adoption. There's probably one step uh, further as well where you can, uh, somebody could put forth a, uh, a uh, Bible of this is a good standard practice. And I don't think there's any, I don't think, or at least I don't know of any one sort of like, uh, approved voice or like open sourced version of, of a standard dialogue uh, for for haptic devices. Yeah, you're right, and we're we're working on that stuff. But there's so much to do to educate and inform people on how to approach an entirely new use of their senses. I mean, it's like a huge undertaking, and so uh, that's part of our roadmap. But it's just one of many things that needs to get done. <laughs>